First of all, I'd just like to say a couple of things. Um, first, I'd like to thank the Service Design Network for asking me on, along to come and talk to you today. I believe this is the first time that someone from the energy industry has had the opportunity to come and talk to you guys. And I think it's fair to say that in the UK today, we're not exactly the most popular industry to talk. Um, so if you wouldn't mind just leaving that bit off your feedback cards at the end, I'd really appreciate it. Um, the second thing I wanted to say is I do apologise, but I am going to be speaking from a script today. And I might ad-lib a bit, but please bear with me and I'll, I'll do the best I very can. Um, just wanted to kick off really with a little bit about my experience about working in the regulated industries. Um, so my service design career started at Boots. There's a Sedley place in London, Boots flagship store. And there it was all about store design for me. So I sat on the formats team, and it was all about building those face-to-face -face interactions with customers, understanding their shopping habits. How do we get the stores right? How do we balance the needs of pharmacy and its regulatory side with the needs of customers overall? What's the right combination of modules? What's the right combination of products? How do we get people to shop upstairs and downstairs? Where should healthcare be? How do we use the data that we could get from something as valuable as the Advantage card to make sure that our customers could get in, get it, whether that be a product or a service, and get back out again? This is going back a while, so I'm not going to tell you how many years, but quite a while. And the internet was way less important then. It was literally all about the stores. So post office, I moved to post office after Boots, and there became a whole new challenge around regulation. So not only did we have the FSA to deal with on the one hand, around our banking products, but we also had the government to deal with around the products and services that we were offering overall. So my area of design focus changed again. Now design was all about reducing queues, redirecting our customers to new ways of dealing with us, trying to achieve consistency in what can only be described as a vast and complex network. So that's about 370 at the time, um, directly managed branches, ones that were owned by post office, and about another 11,000 that were independently run. It was a challenge I really, really enjoyed, but I didn't enjoy the commute from Nottingham, where I lived, to London quite as much. So now I'm at Eon, and I absolutely love my job at Eon, because it's different again. Every day presents me with a new design challenge, and I want to make things better for our customers. I set out to deliberately design customer experiences that are going to differentiate us from our competitors and create an experience that our customers are going to value and will mean that they either want to stay with us or join us over our competitors. We're a truly multi-channel business, so every day in our contact centres we're taking thousands of calls and all our contact centres are based in the UK. We're increasingly engaging our customers over the web, but still for us at this moment in time, it's a relatively small proportion of our business, and we know we've got lots of work to do. But we've also more recently started to engage our customers more prolifically face-to-face -face through our open house, which is in Nottingham. It's the first retail store in the energy industry in the last, I think, 20 years. I'm looking to my right-hand side. Sorry, I have a button presser here because I have a script in my hand. Um, and she actually works. This is, Nikki, do you want to come and say hello? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> so Nikki actually worked on the design of our open house. <laughs> Um, uh, and she's done a tremendous job. We get great feedback from our customers. Um, but it is a completely face-to-face. -face. So you can bring in your bill into the open house, and you can come and talk to us, and you can find out what everything means. And we're actually testing that in smaller locations around the UK as well. But we also have our events team. So they go out to big things like the NEC, et cetera, and talk to our customers. And then we have our meter readers. Now, our meter readers are probably the ones that people see the most. We've got around... Um, well, I think they're making around 9,000 interactions a day with our customers, visiting 9,000 properties a day. And so you can imagine what that means when we're trying to achieve consistency across the entire business, all of those different things happening. How do we make that work? So far, thanks, Nikki, <laughs> we seem to be getting it right. At the end of 2012, we were voted number one for customer satisfaction in our industry as part of the Usage survey. We came first in seven out of ten categories. And that's an accolade we've recently retained, as you can see up here. However, you can also see that our competition are really hot on our heels. So we know, as an organisation and as an industry, we're doing lots, but there's loads more that we need to do. Before I focus on the presentation itself, I'd like to get some energy, excuse the pun, into the room. Um, and it would help me to understand my audience better. So can any of you please put your hands up if you work in the energy industry right now, wherever you are in the world? Maybe four of you. 
How many of you work in a regulated industry? Oh, you might have gone up to six or seven. How many of you are involved in designing great experiences for your customers? Yay, loads more of you. So you're in the right presentation, which is um, a really good thing. Um, how many of you have experience in your title, just out of interest? Just a few, okay, that's pretty much what I thought. Um, as you probably saw, many people are involved in customer experience, um, irrespective of their title. But what is customer experience? There's loads of definitions, we've seen quite a few today. How many of you have seen this one before? Ooh, interesting. Um, I like it because it talks about all the different elements of customer experience and how it focuses on the, how the experience is actually perceived. In the next 15 minutes or so, I am going to talk to you about how Eon go about creating the right combination of both the rational and the emotional elements to our experiences and how we try to do that consistently. So before we get into the detail of what this is all about, um, I think that might be one of our lovely meter eaters up there. Let me tell you how we set up at Eon to ensure that we have customer experience in mind. Our original service design team was set up around four years ago as part of our overall customer operations directorate. That meant we were really, really focused on the servicing element of the business, but probably missing out on the wider picture of what end-to-end -end journeys might look like for our customers and seeing the bigger picture that was in place. I joined the team in November 2012, and literally the next day we moved into our marketing department and in doing so, we linked together with a number of other disciplines that were within E.ON already. Our sole remit as this new unit was to improve the experience of all E.ON customers. So we have the hub, our customer experience hub. In the hub, we've got a team of 11 designers, my team, um, a team who implement the designed experience, a team who measure its delivery, and then all the data teams that sit behind that um, and try and understand how our customers react and what they say and feel through our net promoter score system and our customer immersion teams. We work together symbiotically. In a nutshell, we rely on each other. I want to tell you a little bit, little bit more about how we started back in 2009, as it might help those of you who may be thinking about setting up your own design teams, about the structure you might need in place to get it started. The world is full of visionaries. People who just want to make things better. People who are defined, by what they believe in and by the momentum that creates. Lots of them are also very successful business people whose businesses make money because time and time again they get it right for their customers. Our customer service director was just one of these visionaries. He had a vision to be number one for customer satisfaction and number one for customer service in the energy industry. And he was determined he was going to make that happen. So he set up a structure with service design right at the heart of it. He recruited a team of people to plan design, and then deliver those experiences. He defined what he felt we needed to do and to become to be number one. As well as our customer services director, the team also had some top-level advocates. Chief Executive Officer, Tony Cocker, who you've probably seen on the news um, recently, recognised that our future success could only be achieved by putting customers at the heart of what we do. He publicly launched our Reset programme in November 2011 with clear objectives around examining our relationship with our customers, listening to what they were saying, and recognising that energy is an essential in life. It's not a luxury. But that was just a start. It's kind of the kickstart we needed. The support from the top that let us know that as a team, what we're actually designing might actually be delivered. And there lies my top tip for success. Make sure you've secured top-down buy-in. Top-down buy-in is really critical, whether it's internal or external to your success. As somewhere, you need to find that person that's going to be the advocate for you. A sponsor of what you're trying to achieve, because without that, you're not, it's not going to work. It's going to be a really, really difficult path. And if you share a passion for your customers with that person or persons, it could be an entire board, you're more likely to succeed in making change. Although we had top-down buy-in, we were a very small team in a very large organisation around 10,000 people, and we needed to create momentum, a buzz. Something that really would get us noticed in the organisation to get people really excited about what we were doing. So we started off small, but did something significant. In our case, we went straight to the front line. We wanted to show our people how we intended to work, 
and that we were not going to set out to tell colleagues what they were going to do, but we wanted to engage them for them to tell us what we needed to do until we got it right. Well, that got us noticed. As back then, colleagues had never really been engaged in that whole design process. It was kind of one step removed. So we kind of created the open forum where they could talk to us. We asked colleagues what the emotions were when they were talking to people on the phone. Um, and we really taught them how customers felt when they were delivering the service to them. It's a practice we continue today because without it, we really don't know what's happening with our customers. And not only that, we found it valuable, but they found it valuable. They had a voice. They could come and tell us and channel all the things that they knew that we weren't getting right, and in turn, they couldn't get right. In that first workshop, we found the nugget we were looking for. We found an issue that was a real bugbear for both our colleagues and for our customers. So due to old ways of working, what we were doing basically was we were sending out an email, bing, give us your meet readings, and our customers were phoning up or getting online and giving us those readings. And then about three days later, we were sending a meter reader around to the, exactly the same property, their property, to get that meter reading again. To be fair, it was an annoyance to our customers, but it was a massive bugbear to our meter readers because they were the ones on the front line getting it in the neck whenever they turned up somewhere and the job had already been done. So we set about to fix it. And after we fixed it, we measured it. And we measured it to prove that we'd really fixed it. So what did our little unassuming team do when we knew we had fixed it? We shouted really loud. We told as many people as we could. And we were really lucky because within our organization, within this team of advocates, we had a prolific blogger. And he used that blog to tell everybody in the organization what we were doing. And the great thing about doing that is it's a blog that was also read by our front line. So not only could they see that at this workshop, they told us what the problem was, but then we'd actually gone out and acted on it. And they could see the change that was delivering. My third point is find something that people really care about. It could be customers, it could be employees, but ideally it should be both. Start relatively small, so you can go under the radar of regulation, governance, finance, IT, work quickly, I think what was mentioned earlier on in one of the presentations, and go fast to make a real impact. And before you apply all those constraints I've just spoke about to your work, really think blue sky. Organisations are often really, really quick to tell you what you can't do, but they're invariably bad at telling you what you can. How far can you push an idea? How quickly can you move? Where can you get the most bang for your buck? One thing we do find on a day-to-day -day basis, doesn't matter how many people you talk to... Oh, I've lost my microphone. Forgive me one second. It's gone any wall. I shall put it back. Can you hear me again? Got him. I need to find where I was in my script. Um, <laughs> it doesn't matter how many people you talk to, how many designs you create, they will only get implemented if you seem to be, be incredible. So by creating the hub, we've created a heart. And from that heart, we can use the skills we have to clearly demonstrate that to the business, when we get it right for our customers, we're also getting it right for the business. Experience design in a heavily regulated industry like ours can often be seen as a fluff. I think the pretty stuff, I think the fluff was definitely mentioned earlier on, or the nice to have. And we have to try hard to make sure that we're doing all the things we have to, and we're trying so hard that without the hub, it'd be really, really easy to forget what we started off to achieve in the first place. The hub not only makes the designs happen, but it also measures the impact. And it's that measurement that can provide us with tangible evidence of what a great experience can do for our business. So again, we're going back to that whole value case around experience design. The hub gives us power, in essence. In the infancy of experience design at E.ON, the team designed a process. And not alone, may I add. In fact, there were quite a few people in this room who helped us design that process. Hands up if you work for Engine. There's quite a few of you out there. Thank you very much. Um, it was a methodology. It was a way of working that quickly became known to us as our blueprint. The organization kind of took a really deep breath way back then and thought, what's that magic? What's that going to do? But three years later, we still use the same six-stage process. It's evolving all the time, and it's become more specialised and, to some extent, more flexible to help us deal with the different challenges we face. So here it is, our blueprint, our very deliberate way of working. What I'm going to do now is just take you through the stages that we go through, give you a bit of an indication of what might happen in those stages. But this one's really critical. 
Um, and effectively, this is where we set up the work. We need to ask the right questions right up front so we've got a really good understanding of what we're being asked to do. What's the objective? Why are we doing it? Throughout this stage, we're looking to gain clarity from the business. What the issue really is. What does, would success look like? And who actually is going to be responsible when we've done the hard work for delivering the change? I'm about to lose my mic again. Give me a sec. This is always good fun. There. I think we're back. So we've adopted some agency mentality. And first of all, we ask go out into the business. And when a sponsor approaches us to do a piece of work, we ask them to fill in a briefing form. Not very creative, I hear you say. And that's very true. But in agency world, I don't think many of you would actually consider running a massive piece of work without, first of all, understanding exactly what you're being asked to do. Not only does it give us clarity, but it also helps us plan. And planning is essential. Planning is essential in my team so that I can manage my workload, but also throughout the wider business. Once we've agreed the, the what and the when, we then go away and prepare the how. And the how is our design approach. The design approach takes into account the, the specific needs of every individual project that we work on, the time frame, the skies, scope, the resources we have available. It becomes the mantra we live by as we move throughout the rest of the project, and the one document that we always go back to and reference to make sure that we're actually keeping completely on track. In discovering, it's all about uncovering the insights from our customers and colleagues to help us really understand the opportunities or the customer's problem. If we can nail the problem, we can get more creative with the solution. It's also the key stage where we actually talk to people, and it's a great opportunity for our colleagues to talk to us through workshops or interviews, because they're close to the customer, they really get it, they really understand. Depending on the project, it could be as small for us as going and doing some core listening, or it may involve arranging focus groups, or it may be going out even further and arranging either qualitative or quantitative research on quite a massive scale. But it will always involve what's capturing what's happening now. Sorry, I keep on looking at this mic just to see if it's still there. Um, and that's why, so we map all that out, and that's what we call the as is. And that's really, really important, because actually, unless we know what the problem is, how are we going to make something better? The as is not only looks at the stages a customer goes through, but all their thoughts and feelings and emotions that they might be experiencing at the same time. And that might be presented through different channels. Finding those pain points that customers go through really help us design our design principles. And our design principles are always customer-led. This is particularly important in our industry as we need to be able to evidence, going back to the regulation bit, how we're making things better for our customers. Me and this mic are not friends. Who doesn't like me? Try again. Is it still working? Good. Eye. So, developing is about creating ideas um, and, and addressing all the problems that we talked about before. Um, and we generally try then to co-create with our customers. At the end of this stage, we kind of take the personas and we build personas in slightly different ways. So we might just give literally a picture and then ask everyone else to build on it. So ask people what their food preferences are, what their energy use is. But basically, we're trying to get people to think in a slightly different way, not necessarily directly about their energy use, but overall, what else we can do. We then move into recommending. And recommending is about shaping those ideas by collecting all the insight together um, and pulling them into concepts. But this is where it gets really, really interesting because by working in this way, the teams that are responsible for making sure we're doing what's right in the industry can also use that insight and the customer benefit that we've got behind all those recommendations and lobby for change with the regulator in a way that's clearly customer focused. Delivering is about creating the implementation plans that we use to make sure our colleagues understand exactly what we're trying to do in the business. This is more about the implementation itself, and we want to make ourselves as lean and as agile as possible. So what we do is use our journey management team, the implementers, to go out into the business and actually pick up the individual projects that are already in play to find out how we could fix in the short term, improve in the medium term, and transform in the long term the experiences our customers have. And the last stage, which is really important, and I've just run out of time, I've just realised, is evaluating. And that's about assessing whether the deliberate experiences we intended to create right at the beginning when we created our design approach are actually happening. And that comes again back to the value element that we were talking about earlier on. That's about measurement. 
It's about making sure that we're using the big data that Kerry was talking about earlier on, as well as the little data that we can glean from our customers in interactions that we have with them every day. So there you have it. That's how we work. I hope you found that helpful. I hope I didn't rattle on too long. Um, I suppose my question back to you guys would be, if you were working in a regulated industry, what would you do differently and how? Thank you very much. Thanks, Richard.